Good morning. Welcome to church today. So glad that you're here. You made it to the early service today, so it's so good to be with you. So glad to to worship with you. If you got your Bibles, you can open them up to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. We're going to return to our Ephesians series soon, uh, but we're in a little bit of some some after Easter time, uh, and so we're going to talk about an event that happened after Easter Sunday. And as you are turning there, I just want to give you um, just a couple of things, a couple of victories, things that we are just celebrating here. Uh, first off, last week after the second service, we celebrated five baptisms, and so I just am so excited about that. Congratulations to those of you who were baptized last Sunday morning. Um, some are here right now, some are here, or will be here in the second service, I'm sure, uh, but that's so great. And then secondly, at the beginning of this calendar year, I shared something with you um, an emphasis that we're doing, an evangelism emphasis, sharing the gospel, is what evangelism means, uh, called Win 100. And I said that our goal for for 2024 is to win 100 people for Jesus. That means we want to see 100 people receive Christ and be born again in the way that the Bible says. And so today I want to give you an update on that. Here it is, April the 14th, 2024. We're not quite halfway through the year. We're actually not even close to halfway through the year yet. Uh, but I'm happy to announce to you today uh, that so far this year, we have seen 44 people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. So come on. Come on. That's why we do what we do. We want to win souls and we want to make disciples. We make no apologies for that. We believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is what leads us to salvation. That's why uh, we preach and teach and and, and do all the, all the outreaches and things that we do. And then things like small groups, those, those also help serve that purpose, but those are also to, mostly to build up believers and strengthen and encourage us as we walk uh, with Jesus. So I'm so excited uh, to share that with you. 44 people in the kingdom that weren't there already. Man, that, that, that makes me excited. I hope 45 is in attendance today, right? Whether it's this service or next service. Uh, man, I'm just so looking forward. I want to see every light on that board. Ne- next week, as you come in the lobby, look, because there will be 44 lights lit up on that board. Uh, but I'm so excited uh, for the day that when we see all 100 uh, lit up. And I hope it comes sooner than later. So are you ready to get into the Word today? We're going to be in John 21. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for this day. And as we say each week, Lord, we ask that you speak to us through it. Help us to hear your heart. Lord, give us ears that would hear Give us eyes that would see. Give us that heart to receive and to understand. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to read a large section of Scripture today. I'm going to be reading John 21, starting in verse 1 and going to verse 19. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And all the fishermen said, all, right? Early the next morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And by the way, we see a few times here after Jesus is resurrected, there's something different about his appearance. It's still him, and it becomes very evident to him at each and every time. Uh, and there are the scars and all those things from the crucifixion, but there's something different about his appearance uh, after he's resurrected. And when the day comes, and the Bible talks about in, in the end of days, when we're all resurrected and called up, there'll be something different about our, pen, uh, our appearance too. And, and, and some of us need to say amen, right? <laughs> Me being the chief one. So... Uh, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. We're going to stop there for just a second. This would have seemed real familiar to Peter. He would have been catching this because earlier in the Gospels, when when Peter is first approached by Jesus, if you know the story, what happened? Peter had been out fishing all night, hadn't caught anything, and he's approached by Jesus who essentially asks him to to borrow his boat. He says, hey, I want to teach a little bit this this group of people who is here, so can you put out your boat a little bit from shore so that I can teach? And so he does so, and then after the teaching is over, he tells Peter, Peter, Take your boat out uh, a little more ways from shore and let your nets down for a catch. And Peter says, 
hey, I've been there, I've done that, we fished all night, haven't caught a thing, but since you say to do so, I'll do it. And what happened? Huge number of fish, it, they needed help to even be able to bring in the nets. And so this would have seemed real familiar on this miraculous catch of fish for Peter. So picking back up in the second half of verse 7. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish in it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to him, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Still with me, right? Verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter had been feeling about as low, about as depressed, about as down as a person could possibly feel. You got to think back over his previous week or so. Not only had he experienced this terrible loss, the tragedy when it came to the crucifixion of Jesus, but Peter knew and remembered vividly how he had denied him in Jesus' most difficult of moments. If you remember, during the Last Supper, Jesus had said to the disciples in Matthew 26, he said, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. But Peter, with the big mouth, says, not me. He says, even if everybody else falls away, I never will. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. But of course, Jesus knew better. He knew exactly what was about to happen. And now you and I do as well because it's recorded in detail in Scripture. And so Jesus told Peter, well, you say that. You say that you're never going to disown me. But tonight, the fact is that you're going to disown me three times before the rooster crows. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus was arrested. And when that happened, Peter followed at a distance all the way to the courtyard of the Sanhedrin, which was that, that ruling group, that ruling council of the Jews at the time. And then three times, Peter was accused of being one of Jesus' disciples, and three times he denied. Maybe you've heard the old saying before, if someone accused you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you, right? That's, that's an old saying. Well, for Peter, there certainly was. So first, he's approached by a little servant girl, and she says, hey, you were with Jesus of Galilee. And she probably seen him at some point, maybe during the triumphant entry. At, at some point, you know, Jesus was a big deal. People knew who he was. He, he was able certainly to, to get a crowd. And Peter, being one of the closest disciples to him, would have been associated with him and, and easily recognizable. And so Peter says, uh-uh, no, 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 you're mistaking me for somebody else. I don't know him. Well, ding, that's one. Then someone else sees him. It's another servant. And they say, this fellow was, was with Jesus of, of Nazareth. And again, Peter denies it. And this time says, I don't know the man. That's two. Finally, someone comes to him and says, hey, of course you're one of his disciples. Even your accent gives you away. You talk like one of his disciples. You're from the same place. And this time, Peter curses and swears and denies him a third time, saying, I don't know the man. 
three things, or excuse me, and two things happen immediately in that moment. As Peter denies him, first off, we all know the rooster crows. But then from across the courtyard, Jesus is still within eye distance of Peter. And the Bible says that as he denies him that third time and as that rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks him dead in the eye. And it says Peter went out and wept bitterly. After all that big talk, all that bravado, all that beating the chest, even if everybody else runs away, I never will. You know me, Lord. And Jesus says, yeah, I do. So now you fast forward to about a week after the resurrection, and you put yourself in Peter's shoes. Think about everything that's, that, that's happened there. If you're Peter, how are you doing? Yes, you are, I, I'm sure, excited as anyone would be and, and, and just amazed at the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You're, you're excited and, and relieved that your friend has returned. You can't, it, it, it's unfathomable. He, he is. Everything that he said he was, he is. But now you've also got this issue where your last real interaction with Jesus before the crucifixion was you denying him outright. After all that, I'll never walk away. I'll never do such and such. And Peter outright denies three times. And he proves Jesus right. Matter of fact, on the morning... that and so, so Peter's on the outside looking in. As a matter of fact, so much so that on the morning of the resurrection, as the, the angel encounters Mary Magdalene and, and, and the, the other women that are at the tomb, when he says that incredible thing about he is, he is not here, he is risen, and, and we're so excited about that. It's, what, it's one of the greatest lines in all of Scripture. If you read the next line, he says to go tell, the, the angel says, go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. The angels didn't even consider Peter part of the group anymore. That's hard times. And so then you've got Jesus appearing to people. He, he'd already appeared to Mary and the women, and, and the disciples have seen him, and you've got this incident with Thomas and putting his fingers in the holes. And, all, and, and Peter's present for, for some of that. Peter had been with the group, but there's still the issue of that denial hanging out there, and it's an insecure place to be. There's some business that needs to be taken care of. And that's exactly what Jesus does as Peter comes to the shoreline and he asks him, Simon, do you love me? Why would he even ask Peter that? You've thought about that? Why? Would he, he knows the sorrow that's in Peter's heart. He knows all, all the stuff that he's dealing with that just, oh, I can't believe what I did, and now he's back. And, and you've got to believe Peter's, he, he's, he's happy, but he's also afraid. He's got to be, he's got to be overwhelmed. He knows what he's dealing with internally, that insecurity, that fear, that self-loathing, the, 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 the doubting of himself and just not knowing what to do. Why would Jesus even ask, Simon, do you love me? There are three times in Scripture where the Lord asks a question. It's in God the Father in the Old Testament and, and Jesus in the, in the New Testament. Where when you put these three questions together, they point you to what salvation and restoration look like when God accomplishes that in the heart of a person. They're, they're, they're three just powerful questions. For, for some of you that have been here for a while, you've heard me talk about these before but just because they speak to me so deeply. And we've said any time that God asks a question, again, God the Father in the Old Testament or, the, or, or, or Jesus in the New Testament, any time that they ask a question, it's powerful, and it's a reason for us today as we read it to perk up. Put your antenna up, listen with both your ears and especially your heart, because he is never asking a question for his own benefit. There's never a question that he's asked that he doesn't know the answer to. He knows all things, omnipotent, omnipresent, all those, those things. He doesn't need the answer. He's not asking because he needs you to clue him in in some way. He's asking for the benefit of the here, and he's asking ultimately for the benefit of us today. And so three times in Scripture, I'll give them to you very quickly. The first one is in the garden, way back with Adam and Eve, after they'd eaten from the, the tree that God had told them not to eat from, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they go and they cover themselves with fig leaves, and they go and hide behind a tree, and God is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, as he would do formerly with Adam and Eve, and they're hiding. And then God right then asks this incredible question that seems so simple on the surface when he asks, where are you? 
God was not asking them really and truly where their physical location were. He knew exactly what tree that they were hiding behind. But in that, there's, there's, there's a lot more than just physical location in that question because where, where are you also means how on earth did you get to this place? Where we used to have perfect fellowship, we could walk hand in hand, you could talk with God himself face to face, and now you hide yourself. Where are you? What brought you to this place? Where are you now versus where you used to be? Where are you? That's a powerful question. The next one is found in Mark chapter 8 and elsewhere in the Gospels as well, but it's, and I love this one, we've talked about this, but it's where Jesus asked the disciples, first off, he says, who do people say that I am? Or who do men say that I am? And the disciples all chime in, they say, well, some people say that you're John the Baptist, so they're confusing you for someone else. Some say that you're Elijah, so they think that that maybe your Elijah reincarnated. They think about the scripture, that about the, someone coming in the power of Elijah. That was John the Baptist, actually. And they say, and some say you're one of the prophets. So they, they know you're religious, but they, they think maybe you're one of the prophets reincarnated, or maybe you're new, but they don't really know who you are. And then Jesus asks the real question. When instead of not just who do men say that I am, because that does not matter. The real question is who do you say that I am. And who answers that question? It's Peter. Simon Peter. And Simon Peter says, Su he ha Christos. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the Savior that we've been that we've been waiting for. You're the deliverer of Israel. And it's this incredible moment. You can almost hear the the realization in his voice. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're my Savior. And then the third question is the one that we began with. We read a few moments ago from John where after this betrayal, after this stuff, and then the resurrection, he asked Peter very simply, and he asked him three times, Simon, do you love me? once for each time that Peter had denied him. In that verse 17, it says Peter was hurt. He was wounded because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know the depths of my heart. You know how I feel. You know what I've been dealing with. You know that I love you. I want you to notice three things today, and they're on your handout at the the top. It's one sentence we're going to fill that in together. They'll come up here as three different points. Three big takeaways from this message and and ultimately from really from this chapter. And number one is this, God is able to restore any person. God is able to restore any person. That section of scripture is known as the restoration of of Peter. When Jesus asks him that question three times, he's bringing him through that place of of pain and and sin and and heartache, and he's bringing him to a place of restoration and and redemption. What does it mean to restore something? To restore something, it doesn't mean that that, that I just, I start a work on something and then I leave it alone. That's when you and I restore something probably. I start a project and then I leave it in the garage for a few months, right? That's not how God operates. And I don't mean to get any of you guys in trouble right now either. If you said you're going to do it, you're going to finish it, right, at some point. You don't, you don't got to rhyme this every six months. But when, to restore something, when the restoration is completed, that means it's been made like new again. That's what it means to restore. And so the, pro- the process of restoration might in- include, you know, getting rid of old stuff that wasn't intended to be in there for in, in the first place. Let's say you buy a house that maybe, maybe you buy an old, you know, colonial style house or maybe something that was built in the 1700s. And, and, and over time, it's accumulated things from, you know, maybe somebody in the 1960s came in and put some shag carpet in you know, some pink wallpaper. That, that was never intended to be in that house, but fads and trends and those kind of things came along. Oh, that's the thing to do. No, this house was never meant to be like that. And so if you're going to restore that, you're going to dig down past all the decades of wallpaper and pick up all the carpet and those kind of things, and you're gonna, you might have to take it back down to bare bones because demolition is part of the restoration process. 
But then you're able to begin to, to rebuild. And the finished product is to be made like new again. Building back to what it's supposed to be. The Bible talks a lot about restoration. Famously, Psalm 23 and verse 3, it says, you know, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Verse 3 says, he restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Restoration is usually a process. That means it requires time. It requires our obedience. Restoring a house, restoring a car, restoring anything doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 5 about a man named Naaman. Naaman was the commander uh, of the army of, the, of the, the nation of Aram, so not Israel. It's a, a different nation near Israel. And Naaman had the disease of, of leprosy, and of course anybody with leprosy would want to be healed. And the fact that he was able to go into, he wasn't an Israelite, so he had more, more freedom than some of those folks would have had, and maybe he just had a different version. There's all different sorts of leprosy from what I understand. But he hears about the prophet Elisha, and he goes to Elisha and, and, and expresses his desire to be healed. And the Bible says that Elisha sends a messenger to him and tells him, if you want to be healed, I want you to go and, and, and dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And when Naaman first got the message back, he's upset about it. He says, why would I go and wash in the dirty Jordan River? Matter of fact, it says in, in verse 12 of 2 Kings, I believe it's 2 Kings chapter 5, yes. It says, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. But his servants told him, why are you making a big deal out of this? If, if that prophet would have told you to go and do some incredible thing, go climb this mountain or go do this thing, walk across this desert, well, then you would do it. But because it's a simple thing and it's a process, you don't want to because you don't, you don't like what the process is. A lot of times we may not like the restoration process because the restoration process can be painful. Well, in this case, he finally says, well, you know what? Okay, I'll go and do that. And so he goes and it says he dips himself into the Jordan River and he does it seven times. Well, Naaman wasn't cleansed on the first time. He wasn't cleansed on the second time, the third time, or fourth time, or, or so forth. But on the seventh time, as he came out, it says that his skin was like that of a newborn baby. It was completely and, and totally made new. But he had to go through the process. Some of us are looking for that kind of anointing today, right? It takes the age off a little bit. No cocoa butter required. No oil of ole. None of that. Just, just silky smooth, right? When God does something, he does it all the way. And he is more than able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine or think or even require. When something is restored, it means it's been made like new. Last week, we talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 that says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. The encounter with Peter, he was the apostle Peter, but he wasn't feeling much like the apostle Peter anymore. He was hurting. His life had been turned upside down and it was his fault. There was no excuse Right? He couldn't say, well, really, it was this person's fault or this person. No, it was him. It was all him. And I want you to notice something. Even though it was his fault, even though he's the one that was completely and totally in the wrong, point number two on your handout or your second fill in the blank is this. God is, not only is he able, God is willing to restore any person. God is willing to restore. In spite of what Peter had done, Jesus was still willing to make himself available. And that's such a, a, a difficult thing sometimes for people to, to catch a hold of because we'll think, I've, 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 I've gone too far. I've gone too far for the last time. I asked for forgiveness for this already. And then I went back and did this thing again. Peter went back to what he knew, which was, was fishing. Jesus was on the shoreline waiting for Peter before Peter even knew he was there. That's the kind of God that we have in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of mercy, that's the kind of grace that's available for us. 
Jesus was waiting to fellowship with him. He already had that fire going, already had the, the meal prepared. Maybe for, for some of us today, fighting a battle that no one else knows about. And, and, and on the inside, you've been on the run in some way. Maybe you've made some decisions that you feel like now you're just like Peter. You're on the outside looking in when it comes to a real and, and right relationship with God. Listen, it does not matter what you've done. It does not matter how long you've been running. If you can hear God's voice, He is willing and waiting for you to turn to Him. If you hear me say, yeah, He was ready. Peter probably thought, you know what? I'm too far gone. That relationship that I used to have with Jesus, I can't have that anymore. I had it, but I blew it. And that's not, that's, that's not an opportunity that I'm going to have available to me anymore. I've already blown that. Even when Peter was in that place, Jesus was on the shoreline with the fire and the fish and ready to restore relationship to him. If there's an issue that, that needs to be dealt with, Jesus is going to deal with it. In the same way that he dealt with it, just like he wanted to deal with it with Peter. But the relationship and the opportunity for that is still there. Last, uh, the last point of today is this. Yes, we know that God is able to restore. We know that God is willing to restore. Last thing, the only thing that's needed for that to happen is for a person to turn to him and say yes. God is able and willing to restore any person who turns to him. And if you hear me say yeah. Peter didn't have to jump through any hoops. Jesus didn't give him penance to do. You catch that? He, he didn't do that. He didn't make Peter jump through hoops. But the one thing that Peter did have to do was get up out of the boat. He had to leave the fishing and he had to go back to Jesus. Then the disciple, in verse 7, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. And Jesus was right there on the shoreline waiting for him when he came up out of the water. So, Nick, if you want to come up and, and, and play, we're going to close out. You might feel like you're too far gone. You might have a sin habit that you're dealing with, a problem that you're ashamed to even pray about. You might have been running from God for who knows how long. Or just, or, or, and, and sometimes running from God means ignoring those things that we know we ought to do. Ignores those, ignoring those things that, that include his presence in our lives. We run from him and, and, and I, well, I'm dealing with this and I feel guilty about this and I, don't really want to, I don't want to do this anymore, but I'm, I'm too much of a wretch to pick up a Bible. I'm too much of a wretch to be able to pray. Well, thank God he saved a wretch, like the song says. Whatever you're dealing with, no matter how far you've run or how long you've been running, if you can hear this message, if you can feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit, I can just tell you today, you're not too far gone. God's not finished with you yet. He is willing and able and just as available to you and to me today as he was to Peter all those years ago. Thanks so much for watching online with us today. If right now you would like to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then will you pray this very simple prayer of faith with me and mean it from your heart. Just say, Jesus, today I put my trust in you. Please forgive me for my sins. Be the Lord of my life and help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, then I believe that you are born again in the way that the Bible says. I'm so excited for you, and not just me, but Scripture says that all of heaven is rejoicing right now about the decision that you just made. I hope that you'll tell us about it. Send us an email to info at revchurchsa.com. We've got some free resources that we would love to be able to send your way that are going to help you on this new walk of faith that you have begun. God bless you today, and I look forward to hearing from you very soon.